Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Nina Banks. I'm the president of the National Economic Association, and I am pleased to introduce today's webinar as part of the NEA celebration of 100 years of African American economists that began when Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander received the doctorate degree in economics in 1921 from the University of Pennsylvania. Sadie Alexander, however, was a footnote in economic analysis until Julian published Missed Opportunity, Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander and the Economics Profession in 1991. This very important article explored the many ways in which the economics profession and economic knowledge about African Americans suffered um, with the absence of Sadie Alexander's intellectual thought within the profession. Indeed, it is missed opportunity that served as an impetus to my own research on Sadie Alexander. And now I would like to turn the program over to Valerie Wilson, who is the NEA president-elect for a formal introduction of Dr. Malvell. Thank you, Nina. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled today to have the honor of leading this conversation uh, with the incomparable Dr. Julianne Malvell. And Dr. Malvo, we are so appreciative of your time today, as we know you're busy settling into your new role as Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at Cal State in Los Angeles. A couple years ago, I had the privilege of appearing on the Malvo Show. So there's something really special today about those roles being reversed. Now, over the next several minutes, you are going to learn more about Dr. Malvo's outstanding career as an economist, her leadership as a trailblazer in many fields, her love for black people and her dedication to women's empowerment than I could ever put into an introductory statement. So we're just going to jump right in and get started. Welcome, Dr. Malvo. Well, Valerie, Dr. Wilson, look, thank you for inviting me. You know, I appreciate you, I appreciate EPI and certainly I appreciate NEA President Nina Banks. You sisters are holding it down for uh, NEA and I really do appreciate that. So thanks for the invitation and the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, so I heard a, a great quote recently from a black classical pianist who said the first time he, he saw and heard Andre Watts play with the Atlanta Symphony quote, the heavens opened up and the angels were black. Now I love oh, I love it, I love it. <laughs> I love that quote because it so poetically embodies the power of rep representation, how your presence and unique expression of your talents in an uncommon position can literally open a whole new world of possibilities to anyone who encounters you. And in all honesty, you were one of those people for me. You know, I had an angel, the angels were black moment where I realized that economists could be witty, sharp dressing, intellectual sisters, feminists, and racial justice advocates who can hold their own in any room and keep it real all at the same time. And in a more literal sense, you are affectionately known as the godmother of free because it was your advocacy on the board of EPI that resulted in the establishment of the program on race, ethnicity, and the economy that I now have the privilege of directing. So my first question for you is, I was wondering if you could share your own, uh, one of your own, the angels were black moments that opened a new world of possibilities for you and helped shape your career path. Gee, um, maybe meeting Angela Davis when I was an undergraduate, uh, actually not an undergraduate, before I came um, to college, um, she of course was incarcerated here in the Bay, well here in the Bay Area. And uh, Reverend Cecil Williams was one of her ministers and I had the opportunity to go to the prison with him. I didn't get to stay very long and I didn't get to um, really talk to her, but I just so admired her so much. And I was so just thrilled uh, to be there and to her activism, all of that. But, you know, there, there been, I've been so blessed to have really great mentors. Uh, Marsha Ann Gillespie took me under her wing when I was at Essence. I was Essence Magazine's first college editor in 1973. And uh, Marsha just kind of grabbed me and you know, said, we can do this. I went to do an interview once and I was totally 
that I was so unprepared that my tape recorder didn't work. And I didn't even know until I got back to the office. And um, she, uh, she read me and then she said, okay, now you have to call the man and tell him you need to get this done again. I'm like, oh no, uh, can we just move on? And she just said, no, this is, this is the price you pay. But she was one of my, one of my many angels in, in, in my career. Um, but yeah, I, Valerie, my greatest angel has been my mom. Because my mom was a woman, she was ABD, she never finished her doctorate, but she started it when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley in social work. She was a gerontologist, she worked for the Department of Social Services. There was a tiny little cadre of them, of black women who were social workers at the time, you know, white women pretty much dominated much of that. But mom, she took risks. And in her 50s, she opened up a deli. I mean, her career is just like amazing. So at one point she um, got finished, her, finished all her coursework for the dissertation, went to teach at Ole Miss. She was actually the, um, only the second African-American faculty member there at Ole Miss when she started there. I was still an undergrad and she kind of left my siblings in a interesting childcare situation uh, that worked out and you know, it always will. Uh, working moms have to have to deal with some of that. But she, she did Ole Miss for three years, came back to the Bay Area, opened a deli with a friend of hers. Uh, I, but they, they couldn't make it work because her friend was very entrepreneurial. But my mother, a social worker, would give anybody anything. So her partner would say, well, let's just give the homeless people food at the end of the day when we see what we have left. And mommy was like, well, no, they're hungry now. So she'd make a homeless brother a roast beef sandwich and this woman would give her heck of side eye. <laughs> you know, like, really? But you know, when I, whenever I think about my mother's career, I think of, of her as an angel because she taught me to take risks, uh, to keep, you know, she wished I was a little more quiet, but to keep, you know, say what you think, think what you say, make sure you have your argument well thought out. So when I did something once, and she told me I had to write lines. I will not, whatever, I will not lie again. So I wrote about it about five times. And then after I wrote about five times, I wrote, let me explain to you why I lied. I really did lie. What I did was told you only portions of it. So I went up for like five pages of, let me put this in context. So she, she said, okay, I'm finished. <laughs> so when, when we were kids, actually, she used to slather uh, hot Chinese mustard on our tongues if we lied. So those who know me well know I have a joy for hot food that probably came from my, a combination of my uh, tendency to embellish and all that uh, Chinese mustard on my tongue. <laughs> that is a great story. And I, I definitely see your mother's influence and in, in mark uh, in your career and the diverse ways that you've been uh, involved in a number of professional arenas. Uh, you know, this series is focused on 100 years of Black economists. And so, you know, part of that is reflecting and thinking about historically uh, the path that we've been on up to this point. And you're part of a historic generation of Black PhD economists who graduated from MIT's Department of Economics. Uh, based on my reading and understanding of that history, as has been recounted by your fellow MIT graduates, Dr. Samuel Myers and uh, Dr. William Sandy Darity, those efforts at MIT were the result of some aggressive affirmative action efforts that the department undertook in the 1970s in particular. And between 1970 and 1979, MIT admitted a total of 22 Black American PhD students. I don't think any department in this country has ever done no. that. No. <laughs> but there was a critical mass of up to three Black students in any single entering class. Uh, by 1974, which was the year you entered the program, uh, the department reached its peak Black student enrollment at about 14. Uh, ultimately, 12 of the 22 who were admitted in the 1970s completed a PhD in economics and went on to have successful careers. Um, yet, and in many of those names we, we would recognize, we know them. Uh, real quick, I'll list them, Samuel Myers Jr., Glenn Lowry, 
Linda Datcher, William Darity Jr., Julian Malbo, Ronald Mincy, Darius Manns, Maurice Boissier, Ronald Ferguson, Alvin Heaton, Hedden, uh, Rhonda Williams, and Eugene Flood were the 12 who completed PhDs from there. Now, again, we know those names. You all have been very influential for many of us uh, in the NEA. Yet, some of the department's own faculty uh, characterized those 1970s efforts as a failed experiment. And by the early 1980s, admission of Black students at MIT had fallen dramatically. Uh, over the decades since, no more than three have been admitted in any single decade. Uh, and so I, I want to spend a few moments talking about uh, what you remember about those years. Uh, first, what brought you to MIT and, and what was your graduate experience like? Well, let me, let me just back up a bit and say, let's just think about what people mean when they say a failed experiment. I mean, if the net gain was 12 Black PhD economists, I don't see that as a failure. When they look at, did they compare our graduation, our completion rates with those of whites? We were told when we came to MIT that probably half of the people in the program would not complete. So we pretty much were on par with the stats. Um, the other thing I think about is what did people do who, I won't say why, who didn't finish the program? I mean, there's a brother, I believe his name was Keith Hinch, who ended up going to work for one of the feds, um, doing very well. Uh, so there are people, Dick uh, Winstead, uh, was teaching at Morehouse, doing very well. Now, he did not complete the doctorate, and many, you know, this is the same with the, our non-African American counterparts. So if they want to define it as failed, I think that that's a very narrow way of looking at what occurred. Uh, uh, white people always like to change the metrics, especially when they're talking about us. And I, I, I just reject that notion that it was a failure. It was very heady. We had a great time. I mean, with the, the cadre of Black folks, I mean, we, we had our share of tension and friction because we're not all coming from the same place within the continuum of politics. Uh, you know, I'm about as far left as you can go. And Glenn Lowry is probably about as far right as you can go. And, you know, and there was, and we had tension between us. I would own that. But there, there were tensions about politics. There were other kind of tensions about how to deal with the department, what to um, look at. The group of people who came, the group that came before me, and that was a group that had Glenn and um, Sam Myers. And I think I credit Sam Myers, Myers especially for um, me coming to MIT. I mean, he was on a recruitment mission. Uh, he, he, was, he was determined to get more black students uh, into the econ department at MIT. And he came over to Boston College. And when I, was, um, when I applied for graduate school, I knew I was going to graduate school, but I applied for law, journalism, <laughs> econ, public policy, and something else, and got into all of them. And so then I had to make a decision. I thought, I figured I wouldn't get into all of them. I figured I'd get, maybe I'll get into two. Um, and my, my career has reflected the diversity of my interests in terms of all of that. But um, Sam, he, he made a hard case and, you know, I got financial aid. And um, probably the first person I met on campus was Linda Datcher Lowry, who was the other Black woman with the two of us, um, in the class and um, it was just like, oh, they're gonna be, you know, I'm not gonna be here by myself. I have been cautioned that, you know, you may be the only black woman around, um, but I wasn't and that was a blessing. Um, but we, I mean, we did some stuff together, the whole group of us, we had a little grant where we were interviewing people. I forget about what, um, I think that came from the Sloan Foundation, look at solutions for black people. I mean, I think I ended up going down to Atlanta to interview um, then Mayor Maynard Jackson. And I was able to get in because his wife, Bunny, his then wife, Bunny was um, my sorority sister. So she, Delta Sigma Theta. And so she cooked it up. I'd call, I'd say, hi, I'm Julia Melba. I'm a student from MIT. And his office was like, really? And, <laughs> and then <laughs> she called and she said, you have to talk to my sorority. And so then it all worked out. But we had a little grant and we wrote it up with the Sloan Foundation and that worked well. Um, we supported each other. And again, as I said, it wasn't all roses. I don't mean to over, I, I can't over romanticize, but some of us were very close. Some of us were kind of close. Uh, all of us understood that, you know, our success was each other's success. Um, so I, I remember the times quite fondly, actually. 
I'm glad you started out by challenging that idea of a failed experiment because, you know, as I mentioned, I wouldn't characterize it as a failure by any measure. Um, but I was wondering if, if you had thoughts and might reflect on what you think was the difference in those who continued and, and, and ultimately finished and maybe those who went to other fields or, or opted not to complete the degree. Well, I think first of all is persistence. I was very blessed to have Dr. Phyllis Ann Wallace as a mentor. She had a book out, Black Women in the Labor Force that both Linda Datcher and I contributed to. This was, we were first years and she had said, I want you guys to write a chapter, you know, in my book, I mean, amazing. But she, whenever I got discouraged, I often did because I really am a race person and the overwhelming whiteness of MIT could get you down. I don't think that there were any professors who were evil, but I think that there are some who are casually racist. Um, it just, that's just who they were. Um, and, you know, I mean, I could give you stories, of just stories upon stories. And, you know, I cussed my fair share of professors out and that probably was not uh, considered politically correct. But, um, and Phyllis was always there. She's like, okay, uh, now, now how are we gonna fix this? You know, okay, what are we gonna do about this? You know, and um, yeah. So I had, I had Phyllis in my corner. Uh, Linda had Phyllis in her corner. Um, I also went to Boston College undergrad. So I had a posse in Boston. I had you know, my sorority, uh, monthly sorority meetings. I had my church, St. Paul AME church that I attended, which is right down the street from uh, MIT. So you know, if you, I think if you have a support system and it doesn't have to be an academic support system, it just has to be a support system. I think with a couple of the fellows, they also had families. And I think that that made a difference in terms of what their economic situation was, their personal financial situation and whether or not you know, they had enough financial aid, et cetera, or how, how they were going to make a living. Because if you have kids, you have to figure that out. Um, and I think in some cases, just a matter of taste and distaste. Mm -hmm. One woman, I believe, went to get an MBA. Um, so, I mean, I think it was a combination, but I think it's really wrong for the, I, I think that the department withdrew or pulled back a bit because uh, some of the most fierce champions were no longer around or had gotten older and were not gonna fight the way they'd fought before. Dick Eckes, as an example, who taught uh, development economics, he was a great champion for black students. I mean, he really was. And um, he had people over to his home for dinner. He um, would call you up and ask you, you know, how are you doing? You know, I, I heard you didn't do so well in this exam. You wanna come and talk about it. But he was just really there. I, I don't know. Um, and then there were those who were not. I'll just put it that way. I'm not going to disrespect the dead, but the, and then there were those who were not. So I think that the combination of support and then having a strong internal um, advocate. I don't think that Dick Eckes would have described the presence of black students as a failure by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, years later into the, I think I still lived in the Bay Area, but, um, I think Northeastern University had me come and give a talk and he came out and, you know, the, I mean, and came out and joined us for dinner at Legal Seafoods and the, you know, it, it, at some point he says to me, I'm just so proud of you. And I was like, that meant the world to me because I know I was kind of a problem child. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, so I don't think he would characterize it as a failure at all. Uh, but I think that in terms of um, resources, uh, the department might've felt, you know, what's your ROI? You know, if you admit 24 and yield 12, is that worth it? I would say yes, yeah. but I don't know what they would say. Yeah, and, and to be fair, not everyone did characterize it that way. There, there were folks uh, who, you know, felt like, you know, as you said, that those were worthwhile uh, investments in literally, like I said, a generation of Black economists that continue uh, to be influential to this day. Um, you've actually also worked as a, a and currently are working as a, a college uh, administrator yourself. Um, what lessons do you think we should take away from MIT's efforts uh, in thinking about uh, the role of higher education in recruiting 
uh, and graduating more Black students in economics uh, at the undergraduate and graduate level? That's a really good question because we're grappling it with it now at the College of Ethnic Studies. Uh, Cal State LA is a campus that is predominantly um, Latino. It's in East LA. There are four Cal States in Los Angeles, Dominguez Hills, uh, Long Beach, the Los Angeles area. So we're closest to uh, East LA, which is, as I said, a heavily Latino community. And um, our enrollment is probably is, is predominantly Latino. Our Black enrollment in the past um, at least five years has plummeted. So to the point that now, before this incoming class, which we don't have the numbers on, we've gotten down to less than 4%. Um, and we, the provost has talked about recruitment, but there's a new focus on retention because you can churn students through. And you know, this was a lesson we also, I also ha had to deal with at Bennett College. We could get students there, but how did you get them to stay? And you know, when students leave, it's, it's one of three things. One is just money. They don't have the money. You don't have the aid to provide them with. Two is they don't have the academic acumen and there's not enough support around them to get their, the acumen. I mean, I believe you can teach anybody to be a scholar. I really do, but they have to have you know, the tutoring, the library services, uh, the counseling, all of that. Well, this, uh, this college has, has now added counselors, which I think is really important. And the provost and his team are beginning to look again at um, the, re the role of black students. And um, I think that you know we they've had a couple tumultuous uh, semesters around you know black issues, Black Life Matter, and I think because of that, they're far more focused now on how can we basically retain students. I think the whole issue of retention is far more important than the issue of recruitment. You can let anybody in school. We can take them off the street, let them in school. The question is, once you've gotten them in school, what's your commitment? you know, to keeping them in school. And this is true at the HBCU level, at the PWI level, wherever you are. I mean, what I think people in the academy need to understand whether they're, you know, research, at research one institutions where they teach very little, or they're at an HBCU where they teach a lot, uh, what they're here for students. The student has to be the center of your world uh, in terms of the decisions you make, in terms of the work you do, uh, if you're not there for students, go find you a job at a think tank or something and, um, and enjoy it. But you have to really be student-centered and student-focused. And that's sometimes challenging for people because especially if you're at a research world or if research is your love, you have to balance your love for research with your love for students. Um, and you have to be willing to step out of yourself and um, take time for students. And frankly, you don't have to get paid for everything. You know, I mean, folks are like, well, I did so many hours with students, I want to get back. No, to the no, to the no. It's part of your job as a faculty member. Um, so, but, but the issue, again, going back to the question, the learning is about the student. And, you know, I will, I will say that, you know, there have been times that I have sort of gone off path, but, you know, the student looking at some of their little faces and, and their, their hopes and possibilities, it brings you back. You know, it just brings you back. Yeah, so it sounds like it just really comes down to, you know, connecting with and understanding the population of students that you're serving and, you know, designing your, your efforts and your programs and your supports around that population of students. Because you're right, Absolutely. admissions is one thing, uh, retention and completion is quite another. It, it really is. And, and we don't spend enough resources. This, this is why I have a problem with these for-profit colleges. They have no services for students at all, or they often have no services. I'm not going to characterize, but most of them don't. So you come in, I, I met a woman two years ago. She had taken the same math class three times, understanding each time she paid $4,000 to take the class, and she kept flunking it. I said, well, do you have a tutor? She said, no. I said, well, do you have, you know, how, where's your support? She said that there was a woman at her church who was helping her with her math. Um, and I'm thinking woman at your church, I mean, with all respect to the woman at her church, math has changed in the past 40 years. Right. So, you know, I'm not quite sure how much help she actually really was. So, um, 
that those those schools take money and that money comes from underrepresented folks and us people at the periphery it comes from veterans it comes from um black and brown people you know it comes from single moms who are trying to stitch together a ba some kind of way um the three units here three units there and it, it's unreasonable i'm so glad that president obama slaps some regulations on these people and that we have a new president to uh watchdog them because that other one um, he had his own cash cow in a university. And so he really wasn't going to um, come down too hard. And Miss uh, Betsy DeVoid, that will be the Secretary of Education who is devoid of good sense. I know what her <laughs> real name is, but that's all right. Um, but anyway, she was an owner of one of these um, charter operations. So she wasn't going to crack down either. So we're going to open up for questions soon. I see some are starting to come in the chat. And I want to encourage folks, if you have questions, to go ahead and type them in. Uh, I, I have one more that I want to ask, and then I will bring in some of these questions from our audience. Uh, but as we've already alluded to, uh, you've worn lots of hats, uh, including economists, public intellectual, newspaper columnists, television personality, president of Bennett College, EPI board member, daughter, sister, mentor, and your most recent role as dean of the new College of Ethnic uh, Studies at Cal State Los Angeles. Uh, now, that's probably far from being an exhaustive list of all the hats you've worn. Uh, which of those roles has been the most challenging and why? Hmm. I think it's most challenging to, to be a college administrator. I think you're you're basically juggling all the time. Most of our colleges, I have not had the privilege of working at a well endowed college, nor do I think I will particularly enjoy it uh, because the complexion will be very different from what I'm accustomed to. But um, so Bennett College had resource challenges. Cal State LA has, we have some resource challenges. We're blessed, of course, by uh, Assemblywoman Shirley Weber pass a piece of legislation that requires every student who graduates from a Cal State to take at least one class in ethnic studies. So that essentially allows us to expand our faculty some, and that's a but, but there still are not unlimited resources. I mean, the College of Ethnic Studies faculty would like uh, to have the course load at Cal State is four and four, and they like it to be three and three. And um, I did mention this to my interview when I came and they said, well, you know, it, it's it's actually a legislative issue. It's not a I get to do it or the provost gets to do it issue. So, um, but I would lo love to be able to give pre-assigned time to many of my faculty who are doing really great research. But I don't have unlimited unlimited resources. So, I, with, with as a college administrator, you know, as a journalist, talking head, you're pretty much I won't say on your own. But I mean, you're on your own. You're 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 managing yourself and you're managing your time. But when you're managing your resources and you're managing other people, that becomes just far far more challenging. And so, um, but I, but you know what? I I did bid it for five years. I loved it. I left yeah, because I did everything I said I was going. Literally, I did everything I said I was going to do. When I went to the college. I prepared with a PowerPoint with a list of my goals. And literally every goal that I put out there, I finished. And one of the alums, and I, I was having, admittedly, I was having some tension. I'm, a, I'm like, you know, there are a lot of people who need to handle me with a long handle spoon because I am a unique personality and I will own that myself. But um, so I'm having a few challenges with a few people. But a, an alum came to me and she actually gave me a personal check for. She said, because you've done everything you said you're gonna do. And she's, there's a biblical verse that says, uh, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's what, and when she said that it clicked, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I did everything I said I was gonna do. That be, before I wear out my welcome, let me get up <laughs> out of here. Well, the other thing, I'll tell you another funny story. I'm full of funny stories, but my baby sister was the head of the National Black NBA Association, Antoinette Malvo, for 13 years. And she was, she was excellent. She's a much softer, equally strong, a much softer spirit than me. But you know, when you get stuff done, you take folk off. So at a point in time, she was having some clashes with her board. And I said, Antoinette, if you're ever effective, I said, you will tick off at least 5% of the people a year. 
I said, people say they forgive and forget, but they lie. <laughs> but they lie. They, they forgive, but if people feel this, they never forget. I said, so now you, this 5% a year for 10 years, I said, that's 50%. That's a critical mass. That's time to start looking around. So when I was thinking about Bennett, she said, how much more intense are you than me? I said, oh, two or three times much more. She said, so you ticked off about 20% of the people <laughs> a year. She said, so five years is a good run for you. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a very good run. And I especially loved, you know, building new buildings, creating new majors, so, you know, entrepreneurship major, um, increasing the amount of studies abroad that students were doing. It was really great. And so I hope to bring that same energy, you know, here to Cal State LA, but I know, you know, I had to take a break from college administration. It's, you know, it's something where it, it will call, draw you to your knees. Even, and it doesn't have to be hard. It is not, it's just really making decisions that impact other people's lives. Let me say one other quick thing, Valerie, that's really off point, um, but it's kind of on point. You know, my early research was on women in the labor market. And it really astounds me how little has changed since I finished my dissertation in 1980. I mean, I was looking at something that I'd written in like 1992 and I'm shaking my head saying, you know, really, really? I mean, all the issues, especially the juggling that working mothers do. I mean, this has been an issue as long as we've known it. I just met a young sister who is working on putting together a network for gig workers. Now, this is something again, that we've been talking about, you know, since the 1980s. Job sharing, I remember doing a report on that when I worked for the Council of Economic Advisors in what, 1979. So the more things change, the more they say the same. And I think that there has not been a commitment to change the terms and conditions of work, especially for women. I mean, there are dribs here and dribs there and some woke companies have childcare centers or very liberal childcare uh, policies. But um, yesterday I was walking from my office to my house and I ran into a young girl who is, a, that is an incoming fresh woman at uh, Cal State LA with her mom. And first generation Latino family three girls, the woman has raised three girls, two of whom have finished college with masters. The third is just beginning. This woman is a factory worker who had to take time off, unpaid time off to drive her daughter to college. I mean, there ought to be some kind of flexibility. And she was telling me this, she said, I was happy to do it. You know, that's my middle child. I just wanted to see her off, but just think about that. I mean, the, the, challenges that my, and, and I'm, I'm talking to a, a working mom herself, but when, from a policy perspective, it's frightening to me how little has changed, but how much more burdened, and we've learned this during COVID, women are. So it's really a call out to activists to really pay attention to women in work. Yeah, and that, that is so true. You know, little has changed, and I, I consider myself one of the fortunate working moms who does, you know, have access to benefits and, and paid time off, but it, it's really shameful that in the United States of America that, you know, we don't have those kinds of necessary supports as much as we like to lift up our valuing of family uh, and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to turn now, we have several uh, questions that have come in. I want to be able to get to as many of these as possible in the time we have remaining. Uh, uh, the first question asks, what would be a strategic implementation roadmap to self-sufficient economic empowerment for African-Americans? Obviously entrepreneurship plays a really big role in that and how, how many businesses we have. I think we also wanna look at, um, again, terms and conditions of work and, and how we begin to deal with it. But at the end of the day, let's talk about reparations. You know, let's just, I mean, economic self-sufficiency, we could make it. We made it in the post-enslavement period until um, basically the era of Jim Crow. I mean, we did, we, we, we cut the wealth gap in half in just 40 years in, in post-enslavement, in half. So then 1880, we have one black dollar for every 36 white dollars. By 1910, it was one black dollar for every 16 white dollars. I mean, just imagine that. Now we're at one to 10 roughly. So, you know, we made more relative progress 
post-enslavement than we've made in the modern era. Um, so we can talk, so we can make it. The issue really is more than making it, it's basically equity as far as I'm concerned. And I think that reparations is a central part of that. And I think that a lot of my more uh, centrist colleagues don't necessarily agree with that. But Sandy Darity uh, made a really good point in one of his pieces when he said that if we saved every discretionary dollar we had, it will still take us $200 to quote catch up, $200, 200 years to catch up. If we, if we, cause uh, there, there's this trope among, you know, basically majority people that the reason we don't have any money is because we spend it all. Well, poor people do spend it all because they, because they have to. But right. the point is that if you, if you saved every single dollar, if you never bought another pair of Jimmy shows or, you know, any of those things, we still wouldn't catch up. I mean, we would have savings that would be sufficient for our individual families, but it would not catch us up in terms of a community. Yeah, yeah the, the wealth gap is you know, something that I'm hopeful <laughs> as, we, as it's getting more attention and the research that uh, Sandy Berry and, and Kirsten Millen uh, recently put out, I think is really getting the issue out there more in terms of you know, helping to inform that discussion around reparations and how essential that really is uh, to economic self-sufficiency, but you know, more generally closing the wealth gap. Absolutely. Uh, well, we, you know, let me lift up NARC, the National African-American Reparations Commission on which I serve. It was convened by Dr. Ron Daniels in maybe 2015, before everybody was talking reparations and through NARC and NCOBRA, the National Coalition of Africa, oh, and NCOBRA, Okay, I'm going to forget, but it's reparations for Black Americans. But, but anyway, through Incobra and NARC, we were able, able to hold hearings on June 19th, 2019, uh, on reparations and HR 40, uh, with Sheila Jackson Lee having convened us, having really picked up the baton from uh, the Honorable Congressman uh, John Conyers, you know, who made his transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember remember that seeing the, the videos of that hearing. Um, we, we have another question, uh, the, referencing your, your role as an uh, HBCU president. Uh, can you talk more about your perspectives on the role of HBCUs in serving the Black community? Uh, should we be more worried about the trend of HBCUs closing? Uh, in particular, at least 15 have closed since 1997. Number one, yes, we should be extremely concerned about HBCUs closing. Uh, but our concern should transcend lip service. Mm -hmm. If you did not go to an HBCU, adopt one. Find one that you can send $25 a month to. It makes a difference. It really does make a difference. HBCUs do stuff that no other colleges do, um, both in terms of the groundbreaking work of places like Howard University, uh, certainly um, Tuskegee Institute and Hampton, those are our biggest schools with the biggest endowments. But the smaller colleges like Bennett, you know, and um, many others, we do great work too. And one of the things we do, we take young people where they are, we take them to where they're gonna be. I mean, we're the bridge, our backs are the bridge they walk over. And we're able, especially when we're private, to, if we're state institutions, we have some challenges uh, around things like admissions. But if we're private, you know, I, I have been known I did it until admissions told me to stop. And then I kept doing it anyway to meet a sister. She said she wants to go to college. She didn't have all the requirements. I'm not to come, just come on. All you have to do for me is give me a B average. That's all you have to do for me. You, if, you, if you're willing to put the elbow grease in, I'm willing to take a chance on you. And HBCU, private HBCUs can do that. Mm -hmm. Now we can't do it every day and we can't do it for everybody because after, after all the feds, monitor us like everybody else in terms of completion rates, graduation rates, and all of that. But HBCUs are a service to our community. Uh, we also are frequently located in the hood or in predominantly black communities. So we also become a source of employment. We become a source of investment uh, and we're economic drivers. So all those things need to be considered when we look at HBCUs. But I would tell people who didn't go, these are foundational institutions in our community, invest in them. I want to connect that to the discussion that we were having earlier, and there's a comment here as well about exploitation in the for-profit sector. 
you know, given the essential role that HBCUs serve in educating uh, Black students and really, you know, being a service in those communities where they're located, why do you think there had been and has been such a, a shift or trend towards uh, more Black students enrolling in for-profit institutions over attending HBCUs? Well, a couple of things go. Those those are for-profit institutions advertise like crazy. And if you're an insomniac, like I am in the middle of the night, you hear, see, come to blah, blah, blah. We've got all this for you. So, you know, there people are being inundated by false advertising and it does influence some of their decisions. Secondly, um, while the, the for-profit colleges encourage uh, students, and they're not all young, many of them are actually mature students, but encourage them to take on debt uh, to pay their tuition, um, HBCUs don't necessarily do that. Now, some of us do. I mean, you got to pay your bill some kind of way. I mean, one of my funniest things that happened, Valerie, when I went to Bennett, um, I had written an article for USA Today in which I said tuition should be free. So this lady, they owed their family. So she clipped the article and sent it to me. She said, you underlined, you said tuition should be free. And I wrote her back. I said, you know, when I was a columnist, I behaved like a columnist. And now that I'm a president, I need this bill paid. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you got to pay the bill. But, um, I th but I think that the relentless advertising is one thing. The fact that students don't necessarily know what they don't know in terms of how much nobody thinks they need remediation. If you ask so, and no one thinks they need remediation, but you know what? A lot of people do. And so they don't, they don't this college has no counseling. It has no tutoring. It has none of that. Um, and then, you know, our HBCUs are clustered, you know, in the South. Mm -hmm. There are a few in, in Pennsylvania, but we're clustered in the South, Pennsylvania and Ohio. So that's, the, I mean, there's sort of like the spatial mismatch of where people are and where our HBCUs are. But I think that in the uh, context of well, ha what have we learned about COVID, one thing we learned is that we don't always have to get in a room. Right. You know I mean, Zoom has created all kinds of possibilities and I'm encouraging colleagues to um, think about classes that could be offered online um, to our people, uh, whether they're through an HBCU, they certainly could be, or in other ways. I mean, we're coming back, school starts on the 23rd, we're gonna be half hybrid. No, not half hybrid, half remote and half, you know, half in person. And we're it, it, just because people are still trying to figure out how to deal with this during thing. Yeah. It, you mentioned your uh, role in, in, as a columnist and in your uh, statement that <laughs> tuition should be free in a piece in USA Today. Uh, we have a question here uh, that says current times seem to call for greater understanding of economic issues in society. So this is referencing your role as a journalist. From your journalism background, what do you think are the barriers to more popular discussions of uh, economic issues? Or I don't think that understanding. Why well, I don't think that a lot of writers are capable of making it plain to the average reader. I mean, we, we could have a conversation um, about economic issues. And many people's eyes are going to glaze over. And so we have to really break it down to bite-sized nuggets and make it possible for people not only to read, but to get excited about or be motivated by, or to say, gee, how does this really affect me? And um, that's what I think I did for a large part of my uh, work as a columnist and as a commentator is to really just try to break it down. I do a lot less of that now, different roles, et cetera. But I think that really we need to see more econ students com combine their econ acumen with a journalism degree so that they can basically go write for the LA Times or New York Times or their local paper and really deal with it. The other issue is what's happening in the newspaper industry. Certainly, uh, we've seen we've lost newspapers. We've seen newspapers get thinner. So there's a lot of competition for space. So when you have an editor who doesn't get it to say, gee, I want to write a piece about inflation. That's, <laughs> I mean, you've got to really put a hook on it. Um, and there are hooks you can put on it. You can look at the cost of a, a, of a loaf of bread and how it's gone up in the past year, even, because we've seen many staples around food going up because of supply chain issues because of COVID. But a, a, a good 
writer can pitch an editor to make them excited about an econ story. And that's what's missing. So the next question sort of goes back to the conversation we were having about the quote unquote MIT experience, experiment uh, in recruiting black students. Uh, what would it take for a university to undertake a similar recruitment effort in this decade? Uh, do you think it's feasible? And what would be the implications for the economics profession and economic policy in general? First of all, anything is feasible. Anything is feasible, anything is possible. I think that basically it's an issue of the, having the will to do it. And really, I think that what, the, what MIT did that was great was that we weren't isolated. We weren't coming there in ones. Uh, we were, you know, there was a crew of us, um, you know, really a posse. So we were able, to, our diversity was, you know, our strength. We people from the West Coast, from the East Coast, but also, as I alluded to earlier, different ideological perspectives. Um, so, you know, it, so that was a, a blessing. If someone wants to replicate that, I would recommend that they do no, no fewer than three students per cohort, no fewer than three and as many as five, that they be prepared to offer those students significant financial aid as well as something, some kind of a lodestar, someone in the program who we know that if something goes wrong, like we all knew we could go to Dick Eckes if something is wrong, that there's a faculty member who's taking a particular interest in that. Then what you would need is to um, recruit and recruit with, a, with a, um, the issue of diversity within Black people in mind. Um, but to be mindful, I mean, the. Um, NEA summer program is one good place to potentially recruit, but there are other places to recruit. All economists should, should not have had to major in econ as an undergrad. I mean, if they have the math skills and the math skills have become increasingly important, they can hang. So, um, but again, it's, it's and then fourth, um, they need to be able to mainstream folks into research and teaching that's reflective. Um, so, you know, partnerships with places perhaps like Brookings and Brookings does an okay job with the, I, they've just brought on a, a young black woman economist there. Um, but places like that, um, you know, basically making sure people have those kind of opportunities. I mean, MIT did that for me. That's how I ended up at the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, one of the faculty members said, how would you like to go work at the White House? And I'm like, really? Oh yeah, I'm down. So, uh, but you really, really need to take your time to basically um, construct that. And it would take money. Yeah. But, but you know, that's okay. And I think also what folks should um, be willing to do is to look at the, it's not a possibility, a failure. It's a question of people's growth and learning and choices. I'm on the board of an organization that gives um, students, science students, scholarships. And um, it was very interesting. The first cohort, we gave 10 full scholarships, $25,000 uh, to students. Three of them decided after working you know, at a particular place for a summer, they didn't want to do that no more. And we have to, you know, how does someone know at 18, 19, 20, what they really want to do? So we have to be willing to say, there will be some variance. And it has nothing to do with the failure of a program or the failure of a person it's just that life changes. Yeah, that is, is great advice, and I think important for not just econ departments, but you know, institutions of higher education across the board to take into consideration as the, you know issues of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, again, that you know, seem to be an issue that's gaining more attention nationally. Um, I, I want to sort of um, touch back on a question that we started earlier and I was mentioning all the various hats that you've worn. I asked you what role was most challenging and, and why. I wanna flip that and ask you which of those roles uh, has been most rewarding for you and why? Hmm. Well, I think the whole realm of the commentary work I've done, be it TV, radio, or print has been very rewarding. It's given me a microphone it's allowed me the opportunity to uh, meet with members of Congress, testify on the Hill, um, submit written testimony uh, to the congressional record. 
um, and really to lift up some of the issues that I care about in the context of basically the perspective of a feminist African American woman. Uh, these, uh, you know, we know that in the policy space there remains white male domination. Uh, we know that you know white women have have somewhat cracked in, and we're seeing increasing numbers of uh, black folks, Latinos, and others. But I think that the, having that microphone and that perch was very, very rewarding. All right, so again, getting uh, sort of building on that and thinking about uh, the new chapter that you're uh, getting ready to begin, what, uh, what do you hope will be your big accomplishment or what's your uh, vision or goal for your new position as Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies? Well, I'm hoping that we can take the College of Ethnic Studies and place it in the, in the center of the conversations about critical race theory, ethnic studies, and, and that. Our, our Pan-African Studies Department is developing a master's, and I do hope that, you know, that one of my legacies will be that. One of the most exciting things that I'm working on, Valerie, with the, with the team, of course, is the um, development of American Indian Studies Department, which does not exist. In the California legislation, American Indian Studies is mentioned and in the charter of the College of Ethnic Studies, American Indian Studies is mentioned, but there's no department. Now, what I am reminded of, uh, having been out of academe for a minute, is the bureaucratic hurdles that exist in academe. But at the same time, I got, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the green light to hire one professor in uh, American Indian Studies. And we're hoping to convince the provost that maybe it ought to be two. We're going to house them in Chicano uh, Latino studies for the moment because they have to have a department. But we are hoping that within three years, three to four years, depending, um, that we will be able to have a, a department. Uh, with the professor that we hire, uh, he or she will be my thought partner in how we play this department development out. So I'm really excited about that. And that, that will be a legacy. So uh, you were mentioning earlier, we were talking a bit about econ departments, and we have one comment here about uh, broadening the background of underrepresented students uh, that are recruited for economic graduate programs. Um, and the fact that the field could benefit from, from training students uh, to do more qualitative research uh, in addition to the, the quantitative work, uh, you know, to look at many issues uh, such as environmental justice is, is what's listed here. Um, what are your thoughts about recruiting from a broader range of um, majors? And you, you mentioned this, uh, such as criminal justice or, or geography or, or the like. Well, I think it makes sense to broaden the net in terms of, like I said, you don't have to have an undergrad econ degree to get a doctorate. However, I also think that we have to be realistic the doctoral attainment is highly quantitative. We would, if we want to talk about it being more qualitative, we would have to talk about um, adjusting the requirements of some of these departments. And you know, you can imagine the resistance that you would get. I do, I do think that the quality of economic research has deteriorated in favor of this quant, you know, this quantitative stuff where you know you slap up a bunch of equations and you come to a conclusion. I think there are many other ways to approach it. I think you can't talk about capitalist patriarchy um, and the way, and predatory capitalism with equations. I mean, I think that you can, but you, there are also qualitative ways to look at it. So um, my own work has drifted away from all that heavy mathematics uh, to look more at you know, economic history and some other issues. And I think that um, the, the, the field would be blessed with a broadening. I think we also need to look more carefully at sort of interdisciplinary things and at ways that people can work in teams that really uh, allow for different perspectives. I know one of the things that has been great about EPI is that it actually does attempt to put people in teams, although we are highly qualitative at EPI, well, let's just admit it. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's an openness for um, essentially a broader view of the economics profession. And I think that's important for economists, present and future. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's important is this being <laughs> what I call quantitative in context. Like, you know, what are what do the numbers and the equations mean? Like, how do we translate and interpret that uh, into to meaning for people's lives and, and policy and, and things like that? Uh, and so I, yeah, I think we've, we've made some, some progress in, in moving more in that direction. And I agree that I think the economics profession in general would benefit from sort of understanding the broader context of the things that we study and try to measure and quantify, some of which is very difficult to put a specific number on. Well, so precisely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we have another question here about uh, uh, public intellectualism, and I think I can probably get to maybe a couple more. Um, what are your current thoughts about the state of public intellectualism? And in what ways would you change the discourse? I think the, um, well, I'll, I'll, the, the, your set is adorable, by the way. Um, my mom said to me once, um, after she witnessed a particularly intense uh, exchange that I had with someone, she said, you know, we didn't want you to get a PhD so you could yell for five minutes at white people. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> And um, I mean, there was a period, I think it be, was ushered in with the Clinton impeachment, where basically it got pretty snarly and ugly out there. Um, and I think that that last person who was the president exacerbated that. Um, you know, I, the presence of, of Fox News has exacerbated that. I think people are coming back inside a little bit and that people are less combative. And I think that's really important because I think you want thought. I'm, I'm really excited about some of the things Roland Martin is doing, not just his program, which I appear on regularly, but also the fact he's got this little series called We've Got Next, or he's got an elder and a younger person talking, and that's public intellectualism. And it's also lifting up some of the younger people who basically haven't had the, the exposure you know, that others have had. I think that's really exciting. The Black News Channel, um, Charles Blow has a program um, that really the conversation by design is really very respectful and not very contentious. So I think that, you know, public intellectualism, W.E.B. Du Bois was a public intellectual. And I think that all of us who today call ourselves public intellectuals fall very far from that mark. He had, they had a high bar. He was an activist. You know, he, he was a, a researcher. He did so much. And so many people now just run their mouth. They don't run anything but their mouth. Uh, you cannot, you know, what have they written? Well, you know, so, so we, I think that we just have to look at who we are willing to call a public intellectual and who we're willing just to call a blowhard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's well, you like, asked okay. me what I thought. <laughs> and I know you're going to give me the real answer. <laughs> uh, so in conclusion, I want to give you a, a, a final word or final statement. Uh, as we wrap up for today. Again, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your busy schedule uh, to spend with us today. Uh, so in conclusion, I, I want to ask you, what are your hopes for the future of the economics profession, future of Black economists, and or future of the NEA? Well, I want the NEA to thrive. I want the NEA to continue to be the organization of Black economists where we have um, young people who are aspiring to be economists, old heads who've been economists forever, come together at the meetings and the sessions and in things like that. I think it's really important to have this organization to promote the interests of Black people in the economics profession. So I think that's really important. Um, in terms of Black economists, I want there to be more of us. I mean, we're woefully underrepresented. And the only way that we will be fully represented is for some of these graduate programs to mindfully and deliberately recruit black students and not to write us off. Um, we need more black faculty in the economics profession. And again, that we could go through and do an audit of the, the ways that unconscious bias injects itself into the RTP process. You know in terms of you know, recruitment, tenure, uh, the whole bit. Um, and you do see the unconscious bias 
I remember years ago uh, reviewing a file for someone. Um, and I looked at the, the, the white woman who had economists who had reviewed the sister's work had said, well, all her work is on black people. And so that was seen as a ding. And I'm thinking, and all your work is on white people. And that, that should be a ding, you know? So I think, you know, unconscious bias seeps through. And again, I know the woman personally, I don't think she's a racist. I think she is a product of her time, but we really have to ensure that black faculty who want to be tenured faculty have that opportunity and that there's support for them around that. Um, and then, you know, I just, and, and, and what we black economists should be doing, so when I raise the question area is charting a path for black America. What should we be doing as black people in terms of reparations, in terms of equity, in terms of thriving, not just surviving? Those are some of the kind of questions that we should be looking at. In terms of someone asked about the environment, what are the implications of this climate change for Black people? Mm -hmm. And I've not seen a lot of, there, there's some climate change activists that I know are doing really great work, but economists need to be sitting at that policy table too. Well, that is a perfect way to wrap things up. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time. And, and I told you all at the beginning, you were gonna learn more through the course of this conversation than I could ever put into an introduction. And so thank you so much for the history lesson, for the pep talk, uh, for the reality check that you have provided for us over this hour. And thank you all uh, for every, thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in future events. Well, thank you, Valerie, and congratulations on celebrating 100 years of Black economists since Sadie Taylor and Moselle Alexander. Thanks.